I thought if I could get this story out there, I could inspire many young people. And to date, we've brought this story, the reading of the book, and abbreviated version of the stage play to more than a quarter of a million students in America. We just did a massive citywide read in Dallas, Texas. 13,000 fifth graders read the story of the British generosity to 10,000 Jewish children. We recently did it in San Francisco for 7,000. Next April, this coming April, we're doing it for 12,000 students in New York at the United Nations and Town Hall and the Martin Luther King uh, Junior uh, High School campuses. And uh, through our nonprofit and wonderful generosity of a number of people, we gift these books into school systems so that young people can read about man's humanity to man, read these very deep universal themes of persecution and prejudice and bigotry. And I am very proud now to see that this book is being bought all over the world. Uh, Hebrew translation is coming out, the French translation, the German translation, the Spanish, the Italian uh, just came out, Australia, New Zealand just bought the book. And I'm very proud to also share with you that BBC Feature Films has just bought the book for a major feature film. But, and I go around the world doing a, a show here that I brought twice to the St. James Theater called The Pianist of Wilsden Lane, which I was very honored to do. And I do it all over America and we're bringing it now to South Africa and different places. So the real purpose for me is this very profound educational mission. And it is my dream and goal that in 2018 here in London, 10,000 students will read this book from all walks of life. Christians, Jews, Muslims coming together to break down the walls of what keeps us apart and brings us together in a massive London citywide read. We're partnered now with HET, the Holocaust Education Trust, and a number of people who are really caring about this. We're looking at venues, and we will film this for BBC and Discovery Channel to bring this into school systems all across England and maybe one day uh, into America. We're partnered also with the Shoah Foundation and Facing History and Ourselves, where we've created these tremendous teacher's resources to teach the book and videos of how to teach it as well. So um, if anyone has a question or a thought or would like to ask me something, please, sir. It's been a very difficult story to tell. Yes. So has this been therapy for your family? Oh, that's a fascinating question. No one has ever asked me that. Um, you know. I think all of these stories are so difficult. And yes, I think that one does have the, if one has the courage, you, you, you do seek therapy, you do, but that's, let me answer it a different way. I think the children of survivors, the children of refugees, myself included, we carry a special burden or a special something in our heart. I'm, I'm often fond of saying that the six million the six million numbers that were etched in the arms of the, of the um, Holocaust uh, victims, they're, it's as if they're etched in my heart. And that's why I go out doing what I do. Um, so I'm not sure if, I, I think it's maybe prayer and deep meditation and deep soul searching that allows you to embrace such a, a mission in life. That's my purpose. And I continue to do because I think if I can inspire one young person uh, to the, by this story, then I've done something right with my life. So thank you for your question. Yes, please. Was there any rivalry between your mom and her sisters as to who was? They going all to loved you? each other, and but that question's been posed now by young people to ask me: Was there um, a jealousy that my mother was chosen? Was there an anger? Was there a pain regarding that? I think that maybe Rosie suffered more. She was always one step ahead of the Nazis. Uh, it's a, and uh, because of, uh, I'm so moved that the Pure Land Foundation has put a book I see on everyone's chair so you will be able to discover how, what, how Rosie's life was saved and whatnot. But I think that these three sisters loved each other very deeply. And it's a stunning moment in the book when they're reunited. It, it, you will cry. It really is quite something what happens. Other questions and thoughts, please. Your grandparents would be very proud, I think. Thank and they, you. And they live on. 
Beautiful. Thank you um, so much. How do you feel about those that deny the Holocaust ever happened? It's and a, yeah. And um, how do you feel about the the Jews still being blamed for everything? It really hurts me a lot. Yeah, that's a powerful question. I walk through this world as one of the as a deeply proud Jew. You can see I wear a star of David around my neck. That was I'll tell you the story of this. Given to my mother by one of the boys in the hostel. It's from 1948, and it has an engraving. Lisa, thanks for bright days past. Wishing you happiness always, Paul. And every time I walk out on stage, I hold it for a few seconds. I also say the Shema before I walk out on stage. So I'm extremely proud to be a, a Jewish woman in this world. Um, Holocaust deniers. I had the opportunity of having dinner with Deborah Lip Lipstadt, who uh, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, who came to see the show here in London. And we sat and we talked for a while. And of course, she's the extraordinary professor of the, the movie Denial and to, uh, shared with us what happened in that trial. Listen, there, were, there will, in, in mankind and in history, there will always be those that deny every genocide. It's not just the Holocaust. What about the world not acknowledging the Armenian just genocide? That's astonishing to me, that because of political reasons, we don't, you know, what a horrendous thing that happened. It's constant. So I think that um, we just have to keep the good fight and be out there and prevail through. Um, as far as the Jewish people, uh, there's a lot of rising anti-Semitism. We're, we're all talking about it. We're all very concerned about it. Um, I, am hoping, I am hoping that my mother's story and other stories like this will just be instruments for good, to present powerful messages. In this particular case, it's a wonderful story of a Jewish teenager and, a, and, a, and a, a girl. And everybody wants these stories right now. So I'm hoping this can be an instrument to fight all that prejudice and anti-Semitism. Yes, other questions? Other, I think I saw. Yes, sir, please. I'm curious to know what happened to the hostel on Willesden Lane. The, the hostel, of course, was bombed. Then it was rebuilt. And I've been back there many times because we're filming the documentary now of my journey. and. Um, what was put on there was a big apartment building. So, but the backyard is still there. And recently we filmed in the backyard on one of the benches, which I imagine my mother sat on, with about five of the survivors, now in their 80s and 90s. And that's all in the film. Uh, many who remember my mother practicing, getting on the bus, going down to, to take her piano lessons. Gina is still alive. And let me tell you, we did the run in New York recently. Uh, and in the audience was Gina, 92 years young there, and the audience went crazy to see one of the hostel members, and she got up and took a bow, and ever since, at least once a week, I get a phone call from Gina in America asking me when she's going on the road with me. <laughs> she's quite a character, and she was my mother's best friend in the hostel. Uh, other thoughts? Other, yes, please. Did you always want to play well, when you were younger, or did she <clears> that? My name is Mona. My mother's name is Lisa. Mona Lisa. <laughs> I think that I came along to take away the pain in a way. I felt it. I always felt uh, I loved her so deeply. And through, just as she took away the pain to her mother through the music when the Nazis came, I wanted to take away her pain through the music. And I wanted to, my parents were so extraordinary. Instead of making us feel, uh, the most important thing is they took the, the story and the message of their story to say, make something of your life, stand for something, be a better human being, embrace the gift of life. They did not give us their, any bitterness. They did not get a, give us any prejudice. They instead said, stand for something. So in answer to your question, I'm being a little bit circular, I loved her so deeply that I just, I wanted to, I wanted to make her proud, you know, and I felt so deeply close to her as well as to my father. There was a question back there. Yes? Did you or your mother ever return to Vienna? Uh, my mother went back one time. I've been back many times now because I w I've been filming there. 
but I and my I'm the the German version of the book is coming out next November, and I'm going back to uh, launch the the book coming out and perform in Vienna. Um, but many years ago, I went there with my beloved sister Renee. Many years ago, and we walked down Franz and Brückenstrasse, and we entered the courtyard of the building, and we were somehow brought to an elderly lady who lived there. And she looked at us, and through a translator, she said, I remember a little girl who used to play the piano here before the war. So we called our mother up, collect, <laughs> on the phone. And uh, my mother was crying on the other end in America. So it was a very powerful moment. They remembered the little girl. I think it's, why is there a rising prejudice on all levels? Why is there uh, situations where we see that a mosque is, 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 is uh, um, broken into in Canada. There is uh, persecution happening all over. Um, I think the rising anti-Semitism is in part related to Israel and maybe the political stance that Israel has taken on certain things and perhaps skewed in the world view, um, sadly. I just recently came from Israel where, I, where I've done the show there at the, at the Kamarai Theater. And Israel's an astonishing country. It's given the world so many gifts. It's just amazing to go there and see and to imagine that it was created from the desert in the way that it was. Um, but, you know, I, I think some decisions have, have been taken that have been very painful for another people. So I think for uh, there's a lot of confusion tying anti-Zionism, anti-Israel, anti-Jewish together. And those are the things we have to work and try to solve in many ways. We have a rising anti-Semitism in America at our universities. It's really a terrible situation you know, going on. So um, other questions, please. This week, the kinder transport has been in the news um, in England yes. because um, one of the uh, survivors of the kinder transport, you may have heard of Alfred Dubbs, who's an MP. Yes. Um, his wish for um, a lot of Syrian refugee children right. to come over mm -hmm. um, to the UK has been removed by the government. Do you mm -hmm. know of any programs? I don't, but we are partnered now in New York uh, in this massive citywide read with the IRC, the International Rescue Committee, and we're going to be doing a big concert to benefit them in the evening. But it's a wonderful thing that you're mentioning, and I will try to find out about it. I think you're absolutely right. Music is the secret <coughs> arrow that enters the heart and saves us, and art does that. I mean, my mother was often fond of saying, life fades and withers behind us but of our immortal and sacred soul, all that remains is music. Um, so we know that great art and paintings and music and the words, they live on long after us and they inspire us, they tell our stories. There was another gentleman here. Yes, sir, please. I want to ask you this quite directly because I presume you are, you are a US citizen. Yes, I am. Yes. Um, uh, my personal views towards the United States aside, if President Trump was right here now, what would you like to say to him? <laughs> you know, I would sit down at the piano and I would play a Chopin nocturne for him. And I would hope maybe that would knock some sense into him, you know. Um, you've, you've hit a hot topic, of course. Uh, you've pushed my buttons here. I'm, all of us are, we are, we are, we are uh, startled by what is going on and upset. I think the best way that I would, I would hope that this story would enter his heart to understand. Listen, I'm out there because I, wanted to, I want to talk about man's humanity to man. There are so many stories that bring us down and break our hearts and are dark, and, but this is a positive story. I'm alive today because of this great nation. And those are the kinds of stories that we have to tell. And I would hope if he was here, he would listen to this and he would open his heart and uh, embrace. Well, there is, uh, there is talk now that I will open the show in Washington, DC. So I will make sure, just, to, just, as, I, 
just as I every night at the show here in uh, the, at the St. James said, if anyone knows the queen here, please invite her to my show. If anyone knows the mayor, I'm very determined to meet the mayor. If anyone knows him, to involve him with this citywide read. Um, I'll do the same thing in Washington. I'll say, if anyone knows Mr. Trump, please bring him here. I want him to see the show. You know. Uh, yes, the gentleman there. My question is, um, at the very end of the, the performance, you play that final piece of music. And in the stage play or what I did tonight? Well, I, I in the stage feel, play. I feel that it happened in both occasions. Yes, I do, a final piece of music, yes. Uh, and I'm wondering if that's to let the audience recover, um, because everyone is in such a terrible emotional state. Right. Uh, and then you give everyone, is that, is that why that piece is well, there? Well, it was purposely done because everybody could take a breath, and then this was the triumphant ending, that she makes her debut in that way. Thank you for honoring me with your presence tonight. <laughs>